His word can be trusted. His word still comes true. God's Word, the Bible, answers life's deepest questions. Receive the Word, a message of hope for today. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast of Receive the Word, a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southeast Michigan. This is Pastor Ariel Roldan, and I am here with my good friend and colleague, Pastor Nate Gibbs. How you doing, Nate? I'm doing really good today, Pastor Ariel. Really good. Uh, before we engage today's topic, we're going to begin our program by listening to an opening message from our ministry partner, Pastor John Bradshaw, from It Is Written. So we ask that you please open your heart to receive the word through today's opening message. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. A day that will live in infamy, President Franklin Roosevelt called it. The surprise 1941 attack on the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii left 2,400 Americans dead. Now later, it was discovered that several opportunities had been missed to anticipate and possibly avoid the attack. But basically, we never saw it coming. Now fast forward 70 years. Journalists said at the time of the disastrous earthquake that hit Japan in early 2011 that one positive thing was that of all countries, Japan was probably the best prepared to meet a disaster like that one. Yet that devastating tsunami still claimed thousands of lives and caused massive damage. Why was that? Because nobody saw it coming. It's impossible for us to know the future. Now, there's no shortage of those who pretend to know the future. Psychics, astrologers, and fortune tellers claim that they have the ability to preview tomorrow's headlines. But the truth is, they wear the same blindfolds as everybody else. So is there anyone who really does know the future? The answer is, yes, there is. But only one person. Today, we're going back to the future. Time travel has always been popular in Hollywood movies. The Back to the Future trilogy in the 1980s sold almost a billion dollars worth of tickets worldwide. And who hasn't dreamed of being able to travel through time? When I was a kid growing up, Doctor Who was big on television. Not that I liked it. The story of a British time lord who traveled through time in something called the TARDIS. Funny how some things don't change. That show is still big on television all these years later. But not all time travel is fantasy. Some of it is very real. Let's consider the night an ancient king was transported more than 2,500 years into the future, where he visited not only our time, but the years ahead of us. Previewing the future is the special province of Bible prophecy. And what makes this form of time travel so fascinating is that the future it brings to view is 100% accurate. And that's because it's revealed by the one person in the universe who knows exactly what the future holds. We're not talking about the wild guesses of tabloid psychics or New Age channelers. Bible prophecy has never failed. And you know... That's a problem for people who claim that there is no God or that the Bible cannot be trusted. What do people do about prophecies that you just cannot argue against? As long as we're all caught up in this long war between good and evil, between Christ and Satan, it's helpful to know not only what has already happened, but what is yet to come. 
And it's especially encouraging to know how the war will end and when. So today we travel along with an ancient amnesiac king back to the future. The story, as recorded in the second chapter of the Bible's book of Daniel, begins with a king who had a vivid dream, but he couldn't remember what that dream was. Let's listen to Daniel tell his story, beginning in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Nebuchadnezzar was the king who ruled the great Babylonian empire from the massive walled city of Babylon, more than 600 years before the birth of Christ. The city covered 500 acres on both sides of the Euphrates River. The river flowed under the walls and through the city. Babylon was located in the area of the world known as the Fertile Crescent. It had an intricate system of canals that irrigated lush croplands. Nebuchadnezzar built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. He built them for his wife. At the center of Great Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar built a 300-foot shrine to the pagan god Marduk. He plated the walls and the roof of the building with gold. The altar was made of solid gold, as were the throne and footstool. It was magnificent. But this king is perhaps history's most famous and significant amnesiac. You know, amnesia can be a pretty serious thing. In just a moment, a man for whom amnesia was a matter of life and death. Don't go away. I'll be right back. In Matthew 4, 4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed specifically for busy people like you. You can watch every word at our website, receivetheword.com. That's receivetheword.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch every word. You'll be glad you did. A few years ago, I heard a remarkable radio interview with a pastor who had suffered total amnesia. He couldn't remember anything, couldn't remember who he was. He couldn't remember who his family was. He didn't remember his wife. Even family photos didn't bring back any memories. He had to learn everything all over again. He had to get to know his own family. He had to get to know his own wife again. He said that she even had to teach him how to kiss which he said wasn't too bad. In the Bible, a powerful king woke up one morning and couldn't remember a dream he'd had. You've been there, waking up in the morning knowing that you had a dream and the harder you try to recall it, the further away from you that dream gets. King Nebuchadnezzar called together a phalanx of advisors and asked them to tell him what he had dreamed. The story is recorded in Daniel chapter 2, and here's how they replied. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. That's Daniel 2 verse 4. They figured they could analyze the dream and make up some sort of interpretation once they knew what the dream was. But interpretation wasn't yet the problem. The first thing was to remember it. King Nebuchadnezzar saw through what they were trying to do, and he was not happy. Tell me the dream, he demanded. And then I'll know that you can give me its interpretation. That is, you're supposed to be able to see into the future. Prove it to me now. Tell me what I dreamed. But the wise men protested, saying, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. That's Daniel 2 and verse 10. No man on earth can do what you ask, they said. And they were right about that. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't about to back off. He knew his dream was important and he wanted to know what it meant. He became so angry that he decreed that if the wise men couldn't tell him his dream and its interpretation, then the wise men in Babylon would be destroyed. Now this was a problem for the prophet Daniel and for three of his friends. Shortly after they arrived captive in Babylon, They'd been identified as gifted in wisdom. They were trained as servants for the king, and they were recognized as wise men. So the death sentence fell on them too. Now Daniel then asked Nebuchadnezzar himself for time so that he could pray. 
he had absolute confidence that God would solve the problem. In a night vision, God revealed the dream and its interpretation to his servant Daniel. And Daniel went in to see the king. He told him this wasn't something an astrologer or magician could help the king with. And he said to the king this, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Daniel 2.28 God was very clear with Daniel that the king's dream actually foretold events that would occur in the last days of earth's history. The dream began in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, and it moved forward generation after generation after generation to the last days of earth's history. Daniel went on to tell the king what he had dreamed. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2, 31 to 35. You can imagine the king saying, yes, that's it, that's it. That's exactly what I saw. But then he'd have said, but Daniel, what does it mean? Now notice how Daniel began the interpretation. You, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. Daniel 2, 37 and 38. History tells us the Babylonian Empire was the dominant world power from 605 BC to 539 BC. History also tells us that King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was full of gold. In the Temple of Marduk alone, there was 18 tons of gold. There was no better way for God to describe the Babylonian Empire than by using the symbol of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was happy with this interpretation. He liked being the head of gold. He wanted the head of gold to last forever. But that wasn't to be, as Daniel explained in verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. At the time King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, he was secure as the world leader, with no reason to suspect that that would ever change. But Babylon was to be overthrown by a kingdom represented in Daniel 2 and verse 32 as the chest and arms of silver. Just a few pages ahead in your Bible in Daniel 5, 28, the next world ruling power is referred to as the Medes and the Persians. Again, a fitting symbol. The two arms joined at the chest show two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians, who ruled the world from 539 BC to 331 BC. Now, the story of how the Babylonians were overthrown is told in Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar, the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, hosted a feast for a thousand of his lords. He called for the gold and silver vessels captured from the temple in Jerusalem to be brought to him. Now, these were holy. They'd been used in the worship of God. Yet Belshazzar used them to drink alcohol from them in the worship of pagan gods. In the midst of this drunken party... A mysterious bloodless hand appeared from out of the invisible sleeve of darkness and wrote on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. The interpretation of these words spelled doom for the mighty Babylonian empire. Let's read from Daniel chapter 5. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That's Daniel 5, 26 through 28. That very night, the Medes and Persians diverted the Euphrates River that ran under the massive walls of Babylon. 
they marched their army straight down the dry riverbed and came up inside the city. Now, incredibly, 150 years before this, Isaiah not only foretold in chapters 44 and 45 just how Babylon would be overthrown, but he named the leader of the army who would do it all. Cyrus named him in the Bible. Babylon was conquered in one night by the Medo-Persian army, led by Cyrus, just as the Bible predicted, just as Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. The Medes and Persians ruled the world for nearly two centuries. But Nebuchadnezzar's dream doesn't end there, and neither does history. Time marches on, one kingdom replacing another kingdom, just as God foretold in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, don't miss this. What we're seeing is that God accurately predicted the rise and fall of two world-ruling kingdoms. But what would happen next? I'll tell you in just a moment. Receive the Word is a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southeast Michigan. If you've enjoyed listening to this broadcast and would like to visit a Seventh-day Adventist church near you, please go to our website at receivetheword.com. At receivetheword.com, you'll also find media and materials that will help you better understand the Bible and draw you closer to Jesus Christ. So visit receivetheword.com today. Today we're unraveling one of the most important prophecies in the entire Bible. I've often called this the master key to Bible prophecy. Because if you get this foundational prophecy, you're in a position to be able to understand later prophecies that build upon this one. The prophecy we're looking at today is the dream God gave Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. And I'll tell you why this is the master key to Bible prophecy. When it comes to prophetic interpretation, there's a principle known as repeat and enlarge. That is, God will lay something out in one part of the Bible Then he'll repeat it later and enlarge upon it, giving more information. In Daniel 2, there's an image made of various metals. And each of those metals, each component of the statue represents a kingdom. In Daniel 7, the prophecy, the same prophecy, is repeated using different symbols, this time beasts. And the prophecy is enlarged upon as more information is given. This follows all the way over to the book of Revelation as the principle continues to be used by Bible writers. So let's review. In the book of Daniel, the greatest monarch of his day had an impressive dream. He dreamed of a huge statue made from different metals and discovered that the statue represented the rise and fall of kingdoms, including his own. It had a head of gold, representing Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon. Its chest and arms were made of silver, representing the Medo-Persian kingdom. Young Daniel, almost certainly not yet 20 years old, came to the king to interpret the dream, to tell him what it was and what it meant. Now, here's what happened next. The next kingdom is described in Daniel 2 verse 32 as the belly and thighs of bronze. More than 200 years before it appeared on the world stage, Daniel actually names Greece in Daniel 8.21 as the third kingdom, which overthrew the Medes and the Persians. Again, the symbol is appropriate. The Greek army was led by Alexander the Great, a young man who marched his men 11,000 miles, conquering almost all of the then known world before he died from malaria at the age of 33. What did Alexander's men wear into battle? Bronze breastplates, bronze helmets, bronze shields, bronze swords. Once again, God chose a fitting metaphor to describe the kingdom that would rule the world from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. But history doesn't end with this third kingdom. Greece didn't rule the world forever. There was a fourth metal after the gold of Babylon, the silver of the Medes and Persians, and the bronze of Greece. The next kingdom is represented by iron. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Daniel 2 and verse 40. The last kingdom to rule the entire known world is described as iron. In 168 BC, the iron monarchy of Rome overthrew the Greeks. Just as legs formed the longest part of the body, Rome had the longest reign of any of the world powers. 
little by little, Rome rose to power, fighting many wars and enslaving many people. By the time Jesus was born, most of the then known world was under Roman rule. You'll remember that Joseph and Mary were on their way to pay taxes to the Roman ruler, Caesar Augustus, when Jesus was born. For more than 500 years, Rome appeared to be invincible, her flag waving from the British Isles to the Arabian Gulf, from the North Sea to the Sahara Desert, from the Atlantic to the Euphrates and beyond. But were the Romans the last ruling empire of the world? What did the Bible predict? Here's what Daniel wrote. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. That's Daniel 2 verse 41. How did the Roman Empire break up? The empires before it were overcome by other world powers, but not Rome. If this prophecy is right, it must predict what actually happened in history, that the legs of iron would not be succeeded by a fifth world ruling power. History confirms that the seemingly unconquerable Roman Empire crumbled in two ways, from within and from without. Wealth poured into Rome through taxes collected from all over the world. The simple Roman life was replaced with luxury and ease. The political world brewed with corruption. Crime infiltrated the streets. The work ethic was lost and immorality was rampant. And as the mighty Roman Empire weakened from within, Rome was attacked from without and divided into ten major tribes. Now, ten is no coincidence. The God of the Bible looked down through the ages of history and foresaw this division of ten. Therefore, this time period of history is symbolized by the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's image. These ten tribes were the Alamanni, who settled in what has become Germany, the Franks, who settled in France, the Anglo-Saxons in England, the Visigoths in Spain, the Suevi in Portugal, the Lombards in Italy, and the Burgundians in Switzerland. Originally, the Vandals, Ostrogoths, and Heruli took over parts of the Roman Empire, but they were eventually destroyed. Daniel 2, 42 and 43 predicted history from the time of the downfall of the Roman Empire to the end of time. No matter how many battles are fought around the world, no matter how many Hitlers try to conquer the world, no matter how many Napoleons, no matter how many Charlemagnes, no matter how many times men try to unite the world as one kingdom, they will not succeed. In vain, world leaders seek to conquer the world. The Bible says that just as iron and clay will not mix together, so the world will not unite again under one ruler. So where are we living today? In the very toenails of history. Every part of this prophecy has come to pass except for one. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2, 34 and 44. History has followed this prophecy like a blueprint and will continue to do so. The political workings of this planet aren't random. God has been guiding and controlling all along and only one kingdom remains to rule the world. God's kingdom. That rock cut out without hands. That's the one kingdom which will rule forever. John in Revelation speaks about this coming kingdom. He says this, And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 11, 15. That's the only kingdom left to be established. Soon Jesus Christ, the Messiah, born in a stable in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, is going to visit us again. The heavens will depart as a scroll, and Christ and the angels of heaven will descend to the earth and gather the waiting saints of God. And as the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we've seen two things today. One, the Bible can be trusted. 
This prophecy is startlingly accurate, just like so many other prophecies in the Word of God. You can have confidence in God's Word. And if the prophecy is to be trusted, and we've seen that it is, then we can know that Jesus is coming back to this world soon. Let me ask you, friend, are you ready, ready for that great day? Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you made that simple decision to trust Him, to have faith in Him, to accept Jesus as your Savior? If not, you can choose Him right now and allow Jesus to be the center of your life. Receive the Word is a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southeast Michigan. If you've enjoyed listening to this broadcast and would like to visit a Seventh-day Adventist church near you, please go to our website at receivetheword.com. At receivetheword.com, you'll also find media and materials that will help you better understand the Bible and draw you closer to Jesus Christ. So visit receivetheword.com today. Welcome back to Receive the Word again. I am Pastor Nate with Pastor Ariel. Now, Pastor Bradshaw just presented an amazing prophecy. Just think, God was able to explain all of that history before it happened with with great detail also. Now, Ariel, Pastor Bradshaw mentioned that these prophecies in Daniel parallel each other. I think it would be good to explore that further. Why don't you start us off? Sure thing. Um, A lot of people may not realize how... God is an awesome teacher, Nate, and he basically gives you a, a very simple paradigm that you can go, oh, I got it. And then he gives it to you again a little different with much more detail. And that is exactly what God has done with, with the prophecies, specifically the ones in Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 gave us the the, par- the the paradigm of head of gold, arms and chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay mixed together. And Pastor Bradshaw broke broke down for us what that was. And this is the template, uh, Nate, that will set the stage for all the other prophecies. All the uh, other prophecies build on this paradigm. And in the book of Daniel, you don't see prophecies again given after chapter 2 until uh, Daniel chapter 7. So I would invite our listeners, if they have their Bibles with them, to open their Bibles to Daniel chapter 7 so that we can begin aligning these parallels together. I'm going to start reading from verse 1. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 begins, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main fact. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." So, Nate, you, you have Daniel. We're not going to read the, the whole thing. We're just going to stop right now and recap a little bit. In Daniel chapter 2, you had these four metals followed by a, divide, a combination of metals. And now Daniel is the one being given this dream. And it begins with, instead of metals, beasts. And the first one that is mentioned is a lion. Now, um, for for our listeners who may not be familiar with this, you can go to encyclopedias and look at a, certain structures that were left from the kingdom of Babylon, such as the Ishtar Gate. And you will see that for Daniel, it may not have, it may not have been a difficult um, thing to see who God was trying to portray through the, the, the lion with the eagle's wings. 
it was actually the kingdom of Babylon. God is recapping and re retelling everything he showed to Daniel in chapter 2, but this time he's going to use different animals. So for, for Nebuchadnezzar, for the kingdom of Babylon, you had this symbol of the most precious metal. And then in Daniel chapter 7, you have uh, what is we could term the king of the, the jungle, uh, the lion, the, 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 the symbol of majesty and royalty. And Nebuchadnezzar liked that. And it was a, a, an imagery that was used quite a bit um, to represent Babylon. So you have the head of gold and the lion, the head of gold in Daniel chapter 2, matching up with the lion in Daniel chapter 7. And it gives us sort of like a, a same head start. Then we're followed by a bear. If, if Babylon is being symbolized by the lion, from the template that we get from Daniel chapter 2 and 8, then it would, it would stand to reason that the bear would be that following kingdom, the kingdom of the Medo-Persians, and then followed by the kingdom of Greece that will be represented by the leopards. And then this last um, beast, and this is how I love how God gives these details. In this last beast, so that we are given an assurance that we're heading in the right direction, we have a little detail in chapter 7. This beast is not described um, before. The, the other beasts look kind of weird, you know, a lion with wings, a bear, you know, raised up on one side, a leopard with four heads. That's pretty odd looking. But this last beast, Daniel just doesn't have a beast to compare it to. And some of the details are there, clearly are symbolic. And this one detail, it says it had huge iron teeth. The same metal that would line up with the, with the legs is that fourth kingdom mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. So it's clearly allowing us to be sure that if, if we're trying to compare the two, you have Daniel chapter 2 as a foundation, Daniel chapter 7 as the, the follow-up, building up on it, and a lot more details being given into it. So right off the bat, these two chapters complement each other and parallel each other. The gold with the lion, the silver with the bear, the bronze with the leopard, and then the iron with this huge ugly beast that is indescribable that also has iron teeth. So there's this parallel that Pastor Brasher was talking about, Nate, in regards to these two prophecies. Now, it's interesting how these prophecies are showing the progression of history. Yes. And it's giving us more details. Uh, like, you have the lion with the eagle's wings. It kind of shows itself standing up. Well, when you read through Daniel, you see that Babylon was kind of getting uh, too proud. Yes. And it, that's reflected. You don't really see that in the gold head. But you see it more in Daniel 7. And then you have the bear that has the two sides. Now, it's interesting that we, you know, Bradshaw explained it. History explains that Babylon was conquered by Persia. In fact, back in Daniel 2, it said it was an inferior kingdom. Because Babylon had conquered and ruled over Persia. And Persia, um, with the kingdom of Media, basically kind of had this uprising. And they're starting to, you know, want to throw off Babylon. But Babylon's so powerful, and it's in the city that can't be conquered. What are they to do? Well, Isaiah, you know, the prophecies of Isaiah, chapter 44, at the end in 45, mention this idea that Babylon's going to be overthrown. And it even names a name. Cyrus is going to be the one who does it. And when you read that description, basically starting in verse 27... It says, who says to the deep, be dry, I'll dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall perform all my pleasure, saying the Jerusalem you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to, anoint, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings, and to loosen before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. The, that was, you know, you read this kind of cryptic passage, and if you don't know history, you you could be like, what is it talking about? But when you understand Cyrus, who was definitely not living in the time of Isaiah, uh, and mm. how he was brought to conquer, Babylon wasn't conquered by straight-out siege or warfare. It was done by drying up a river, just like it mentions in Isaiah. They dried up the river Euphrates, and that allowed them to bypass the giant walls. The gates were left open and they came in while Babylon was parting or able to conquer, you know, a superior nation and the Persians and the Medes overthrew Babylon. 
and Persia ended up becoming the more. You don't really hear about the king of, kingdom of Media. You've heard of king, Kingdom of Persia. There's been like a movie called The Prince of Persia. You know, Persia's a more famous name. It's because it was the more dominant power. Hence, the bear being lopsided. Lopsided. That's right. Now, the the history of it shows also that Babylon was not just superior in in might of military conquest. Babylon was a lot more sophisticated as far as the arts and the sciences as well. Their their mathematical system based on the number six, which Nate should give us some some already food for thought in regards to the use of Revelation and that use of that number, the number six 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 several times. The Babylonian um, uh, mathematical astronomical system based, was based on six, and even today we are still using some of those uh, discoveries that they made or, or breaking up of time. We have a sixty second minute. Um, a 60 minute hour so we we have inherited a a heritage a scientific heritage from a very sophisticated civilization which were the babylonians they were into the arts Bab- and nebuchadnezzar built the hanging gardens which was supposed to be the one of the wonders of the world but the Medes and the persians were more of a backwoods hick type individuals very rough around the edges not much interested in art or things like that just raw force kind of like a bear you yeah, know? <laughs> or like me when I was hungry. <laughs> and it's interesting, bears. Um, you don't think of the Middle East as a place for bears, but Persia came up from the mountains, and that's mm, where the bears. That's interesting. You know, bears didn't hang out down on the plains in the desert as much. They're more coming down from the mountain, and that's where Persia came from. Uh, the next animal you is mentioned. You have the lion, and then you have the bear. What was next? The leopard. The leopard. So, who did leopard represent? The leopard was the kingdom of Greece. If we're going to follow, again, the template that Daniel 2 sets up for us, it, it leads us in a consistent, safe ground. And we encourage our, our listeners to review this material and read, read through the book of Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 again, because chapter 2 prevents us from going astray. So if, if it, the first one is Babylon, the second one is Middle Persia, that third kingdom has to be Greece, and that leopard has to be Greece. And some of the symbolism that we have in Daniel 7 adds to the the metal. Now, the metal itself is significant, Nate, because bronze was a metal that was used through the armies. Um, Alexander the Great uh, felt that it was uh, hard enough to be used as a weapon, but light enough that it could be carried without, you know, wearing you out too much. And it, the, the kingdom of bronze, as some encyclopedias call it, was labeled, uh, was how they labeled the, the, the kingdom of Greece. And so that, that symbolism of the metal fits historically and, of course, adds the credibility that if the lion is Babylon, the bear is Middle Persia, then that leopard would have to be king, the kingdom of Greece. Do, do, Nate, do you have any thoughts as to why they had four heads or four wings why why that symbolism was added there well before we get to that if you were living through this it wouldn't have been if you heard about greece it wouldn't have been a natural conclusion to think yeah they're going to conquer persia in fact if you were living towards the later end of persia or even the middle of the height of persian empire the greeks were fighting amongst themselves Mm. you would never think they'd be able to conquer anybody they hated each other. They're a bunch of individual states that hated each other. Um, and unlike today, you might have Detroit not liking Chicago because the Lions play the Bears. You know, <laughs> they would, you know, in Greece, it wasn't a football game. They actually went to war. Athens and Sparta fought each other several times. So during this time, they had some settlements over across the, you know, the um, the sea in where Turkey is today, that were Greek settlements that were ruled by Persia, and they kind of started a rebellion. And some Greeks came over there and kind of instigated it, and they were kind of troublemakers. So Persia wanted to set an example, and they actually came and attacked Greece. Mm. Greece didn't attack Persia. And they when they attacked, one of those famous battles was the Battle of Marathon. Where, you know, the one guy comes running all the way back to Athens screaming Nike about victory. And that might have been blown up with, you know, mythology and everything. But the Battle of Marathon did take place. There, I've seen the burial mound of all the Greek soldiers that died in that battle. Mm. Persia was supposed to, they were like the military superpower. This is, Athens is a city. And Athens was able to, because of strategy, beat Persia. And that was unheard of. So the next king comes along and he's upset 
you know, Persia got beat, we have to show them. He raises up this giant army, he attacks again. And on the way they're attacking, they meet at this pass called Thermopylae. And there's like, you know, a few hundred Spartans, a few thousand other Greeks, and they're uh, about to, you know, fight this massive, you know, hundreds of thousands Persians in this place called Thermopylae, and the Greeks held out for three days. And the only reason why they lost is because they had someone betray them. Mm. So you you just look, and Persia has the numbers, they have the technology, but the Greeks just have this will, and they're just a fighting society. They've been fighting with each other all the time. That's when Alexander the Great, soon afterwards, comes up, after they er, repel Persia from attacking them. But if you were living through that time, you'd think Persia's going to wipe wipe Greece off the map. But they held their ground. Alexander the Great was the only one with enough military strength to unite the city-states. He realizes, hey, if we're going to stick together. We have to have a common enemy. What better than the Persians? And he went over there and he attacked. And the Germans, later on in World War II, took his strategy called Blitzkrieg, where you just come in and you'd conquer as fast as possible. Don't let people get chance to know that you're mm. coming. And that's, hence, you know, the four wings. The speed with which Greece mm. conquered, you know, imagine an animal with two wings, a bird's faster than, you know, than, you know, a normal human. The fastest animals are falcons, you know, even faster than the cheetah. So wings are definitely a symbol of speed. You had four of them. Greece came through and conquered really fast. Now, Alexander the Great, as great of a conqueror he was, couldn't conquer himself. He ends up, you know, dying because he partied too hard and... He kind of leaves the country to his four generals, mm, hence four heads. Four heads. Ah. And so that's all the history about that. But it's amazing because God said Greece would beat Persia. But at the height of Persia, you would have thought that would have been a crazy prophecy. Out of mm. your mind. There's no way Persia would fall to Greece. But that's what happened. Now, Nate, um, let's, let's do a little bit, expand a little bit more. We've gone from Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. Should we add a little bit of Daniel chapter 8 to this mix? To... That'd be good because that's, a, that's another great parallel. Be because by, by the time we get to Daniel chapter 8, Babylon is on its way out. Yes. And, and the Medo and the Persian kingdom is about to enter into the scene. And so, listeners, this is exciting. The book of Daniel is not providing us disparate, disunified um, prophecies, but actually one foundation after another, like a layer cake. Daniel chapter 8 Again, um, God is giving uh, visions of future events to Daniel. And we're going to pick up in verse 2, Daniel chapter 8, verse 2, it says, And I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. And then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. Verse 4. And I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And, I was and as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground and the goat had a noble horn between his eyes then he came to the ram that had two horns which had been standing beside the river and ran at him with furious power and i saw him confronting the ram he was moved with rage against him attacked the, the ram and broke his two horns there was no power in the ram to withstand him but he cast him to the ground and trampled him and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand Therefore, the male goat grew very great, but when he becomes strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven. Again, we're going to just stop there. We're going to focus on, on the symbolisms of animals. Um, Nate, you brought up the, the, the historical realities that the Medes and the Persians, the, they were united, one was stronger than the other. And in the bear, you have the bear with one side higher than the other. Now we have this symbol of a ram. And the ram has two horns. And the bigger one comes up later. 
which also parallels perfectly with what, what history um, speaks of. Um, and then it's followed by another animal, which is a goat with one notable horn that after he attacks the ram gets broken up and is broken into four horns as, again. What could these symbols be parallel to? I mean, it's, if, if we're looking at them already, we can already see some, even though the animals are different, the, the characteristics parallel each other exactly. The Babylon is passing. So what you had the gold, the head of gold in Daniel 2, and the lion is skipped in this vision. It picks up with the silver, which would be the Medo Persian, or the bear that is lopsided. But instead of a bear, here we have a ram with two horns, one horn being bigger than the other. Now, I guess this this parallels what you were mentioning about history with with exactly the, with the the, the, the Persians, uh, though coming up later after the Medes ended up becoming the more notable ones and, and the more powerful ones. Followed up by what would be Greece and. Nate, what do you think this large horn in the middle of the goat was? Who, who do you think this person was? Well, it's obviously Alexander the Great. He was the notable leader. I mean, he's the probably one of the most famous military leaders in all of history. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask somebody that just didn't know much about history, name an ancient warrior, Alexander the Great's probably one of three people that would be mentioned by just anyone that at all didn't sleep through history class. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing is, you mentioned about the leopard with the four heads, that um, with the speed that, that which is conquered um, through Alexander the Great's leadership, eventually that leadership would disappear and in its stead it would have four notable heads or four generals. And this goat, which has this prominent horn, when that horn is broken, four come out in its place as well. So it's, it's it's powerful how the Bible, how God, like I said, is a teacher who gives us a, a, a template, a simple template to, to begin with. And then layer after layer begins to add more details. And we don't even have to guess. We've been showing the templates. Mm -hmm. But Daniel 8, if you go to verse 20, it yep. says, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Even though we didn't even show you that verse, the parallels are so obvious yep. that they were already there showing, sure, this is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. The Bible in chapter 8 confirms that, yes, chapter 2, 7, and 8 all correlate with That's these great right. world, uh, world powers of ancient history. Which for me is, is an exciting way, Nate, to bring prophecy to a, a, two things. Number one, anyone can understand it. Because Amen. eventually, um, even if you did not know too much about history, if, if in your mind you begin to see that these are parallels, that the gold matches up with the lion, um, the silver matches up with the bear, which matches up with the ram, um, the, the, so the bronze matches up with the leopard, which matches up with the goat. And just to be sure, to, to kind of uh, reassure the reader, God gives the, the, the interpretation right there in this chapter, which to me is God's great um, desire to be under, to, to affirm the fact that his word can be understood, specifically his prophetic word, Amen. Um, to provide as anchor points for us. Now, we've mentioned that there's four, but we've only mostly been talking about the first the, three. The first three. Now, we, we've left out the iron in the statue of Daniel chapter 2. The, the legs of iron were followed by that great beast in Daniel chapter 7, that Daniel really couldn't describe as there was no no beast uh, around that could be described. That he had uh, terrible, it was exceedingly strong, he had huge iron teeth, it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, this is obviously has to be Rome. Rome followed Greece. Historically, Nate, what are some of the details that we can learn regarding the, the appearance of Rome into the historical scene. Again, Greece was a bunch of city-states are fighting with, e with each other. Rome was just a city-state, but it's even, like you called Persia back backwards, Rome was even more, it was far away from anything civiliz civilized back then. Italy was a great distance to travel, and it just started growing up as this kind of like sailor town. And the problem was, if you wanted to be a naval power, you had to have the warships. They're like battling rams. Mm 
Mm. They would smash into each other. And the person that owed the monopoly on the Navy was Carthage. Mm. And so they would almost, if you had a good Navy, you almost kind of owned the money. So Carthage became very rich because if you were going to trade, you had to do it by ship. And you basically had to pay them off or they would beat you up. Well, Rome just happened to find one of these ships that sank and pulled it off, unbuilt it, figured out how to build them, made improvements on them, and started building it better. After, you know, and then they started, you know, kind of flexing their military might. And there was basically these these wars, um, they're called the Punic Wars, there's three of them. One of the most famous ones is the one in the middle. So Rome wins the first Punic War, and they kind of say to Carthage, we're the naval power now. So they're starting to become powerful, but still, it's nowhere near what Greece was. And this guy uh, inherits Carthage, and his name's Hannibal. And he's told over and over again all the evils of Rome and how bad they were. And his whole life is being raised to conquer Rome. And so he, he, what he does is he goes to where Spain is right now, and he puts his army there and builds it up, and he gets all this stuff. He even gets elephants. And he realizes that Rome has the navy now. So he has to get over there and fight on land. So he makes a pathway through the Alps, mm. which is just crazy marvel that he was able to take elephants up through the Alps down into Italy. And he starts fighting. And this guy Hannibal, he does these, these crazy battles. And not to get into all the details, but one of them, he was able to just out-trick the Romans. And 70,000 people were killed in one day. And wow. this is not guns. Hmm. This is swords. Before this torpedoes is, and missiles. And yeah, the, you know, that, that happens. Sure, that happened in the Civil War. That happened in the later wars. But we're not talking about guns. So Gunpowder or cannons. We're talking about swords. One-on-one. One-on-one. On one, one on one, you kill somebody with your hands or, you know, with a weapon in your hands. And so he was able to stra strategically whoop Rome. In fact, after he got into Rome, he never lost a battle. Hmm. He never lost a battle, but how he was beaten was they, they did this thing called Fabian strategy. They're like, we own the Navy. He can't get supplies. We'll just sit in and let him taunt us and mock us and do whatever we want. We'll burn all the crops. We'll sit in the city and starve him to death. Mm. They would try doing that, but the Romans were so proud. They'd be lured out the battle, get whooped. And as they finally said, nope, we're just going to starve him to death. Well, he ran out of the supplies, had to go home beaten hmm. and then later on they they saw that carthage is building it up again and so the third punic war they said instead of having them come over and do that again and all that terror that happened you know things being um, destroyed and everything we're going to take the battle to carthage so the third punic war rome goes and conquers carthage and this created a shift in rome's thinking instead of we're going to just you know live our life and if we get attacked, we beat them. No, no, no. We're going to be preemptive in our strikes. Aggressive now. We're going to be aggressive. So they took out Carthage, and then Greece starts rising up. And, you know, the, there's, you know, the four kingdoms basically became two. And they're becoming too powerful. And Rome's like, no, we're not going to have another Carthage. Mm. We're going to go over there and take them out. So if it wasn't for Carthage doing what it did to Rome, Rome would have never thought of going mm. way over and beating Greece. And so you hear all this and you're like, wait, where's Carthage in this? Carthage is not even mentioned because it gets taken out by Rome. But because of Carthage, Rome develops a strategy. If there's an enemy, we have to take them out. And it didn't just stop with Greece. Hmm. They went way to the east. They went way to the west. And then they're like, hey, we need to even go north. And they started going into places like Germany, where Germany is today. And they went all the way up into England. Wow. Because... They would hear about some tribe that was flexing its muscle, and they're like, we have to go conquer them. And so they went from republic to empire because they were afraid of being mm. attacked. Mm. So they became the attacker. And it's interesting that I'm listening to you describe this, this historical progression, and you see the footprint getting larger and larger and larger with, with each um, succeeding king, kingdom. And it, it stands to reason that everything you've the, described about Rome ends up becoming Rome uh, dreadful, terrible, exceeding strong, very aggressive, very dominant. Um, in Daniel chapter 8, you have uh, the, the horns. Uh, um, after the, the goats uh, disappears from the scene, you have this 
uh, horn that comes out, this large horn that is broken. And Daniel chapter 8 begins to change the, sh uh, the focus, not so much of the footprint horizontally, but it begins to add another dimension, which is the, the vertical one. It's no longer just a political battlefield, but a historical one. I mean, a theological one. So we, we have this um, gradual transition of horizontal growth, horizontal growth, horizontal growth, geographically. But when we get to Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 obviously does it as well, but in Daniel chapter 8, you see this transition really abruptly where you have the four horns being broken off. And then we're going to pick up in verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And they were running out of time, but... Be, we're beginning to see that the, the prophecy is beginning to, the focus is no longer just concerned with showing us that God knows uh, the historical future, but that this historical future would also become intertwined with spiritual um, implications. Impl implications that uh, the, the world empires will not just be aggressive towards each other. Eventually, through Rome, a shift would take place even within Rome that the, their aggressiveness, their desire for expansion would go beyond just reaching earth uh, with, with the, within the kingdoms of earth, but will begin to stretch upwards towards heaven. But I guess we're running out of time. Um, we would have to discuss some of those details at a, at a, at a future um, program. But I guess we, we can leave our listeners with some encouragement that as we have learned to study the prophecies and, and take advantage of how God puts these parallels one after the other, building with greater detail, that there's opportunities for growth in understanding of the Bible. Native, our friends wanted to continue on because obviously 30 minutes is not enough. Uh, what opportunities do, do our listeners have to be engaged with um, continuing to study the Word of God and learning more? Yeah, there are... Bible studies that you can request that would go into the details of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and explain more about this little horn in Daniel 8 and as well as the little horn in Daniel 7 and then, you know, other prophecies in Daniel 8 that we didn't even get to touch on. You can just go to uh, receivetheword.com and to go to the contact us or just ask for Bible studies on the web or you can call 734 five zero six eight one eight eight that's seven three four five zero six eight one eight eight and you can ask for bible studies there or if you would like you can write receive the word p.o box two three three five seven detroit michigan four eight two two three that's p.o box two three three five seven Detroit Michigan four eight two two three so whether you want to call us or write us or visit the web you can ask for Bible studies and you can dig deeper into the prophecies of Daniel especially Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 as well as other prophecies and other subjects and get to know your Bible on a deeper level I'm glad that we were able to put this platform down I am encouraged uh, Nate by both the simplicity and how it can help us to grow from where we're at at each time that we look at these prophecies, specifically in the context of how it relates to worship, to judgment, which uh, in a later program we will be addressing. I want to thank you, listener, for joining us, and we want to continue to encourage you to be as the Christians were in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, who they received the word and studied it daily. We hope that that will be your experience as you grow in, in the knowledge of the Lord. Until we meet again on the radio waves at Receive the Word, may God bless you. Receive the Word is a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southeast Michigan. For more information, go to receivetheword.com. That's receivetheword.com. Or you can call 734-506-8188. That's 734-506-8188. You can also write to us at Receive the Word. 
P.O. Box 23357, Detroit, Michigan, 48223. That's P.O. Box 23357, Detroit, Michigan, 48223.